broadcasting live from the United States of America and around the world. Stopping consciousness for future living. Now your hosts of Other World Global Radio, Natalie and Sandra Sabatini. Hello and welcome to Other World Global Radio. I am your host, Sandra Sabatini. And I'm your co-host, Natalie Sabatini. And it's great pleasure to be with you as we celebrate another year in broadcasting. My goodness, it's been years now that we've been broadcasting as we have a very, very special show for you today. Natalie, who do we have with us? Yes, you're absolutely right, Sandra. Actually, today we have Gary Voss and Jeff Lewis on the program, and they're going to be talking to us about alternative energy methods, global trends now, and the future. This is going to be really, really, really special for you guys out there. Um, You know, there's so much to cover. We're going to have a plethora to cover here. The information is going to be very intense. So I'm going to tell you guys right now, grab a piece of paper and a pen because you're going to want to write all this stuff down because Gary and Jeff are going to be covering so much for you guys today about what they're doing uh, with alternative energy technologies, what they're coming up with these IntelliTrees, which have blown my mind, Natalie, looking at the information on their website. Um, You know, without any further delay, let's go ahead and bring them in. I know right now we well, Gary is getting ready to join us. Um, Jeff is a husband, a father, a waterologist. He's the founder of PlanetOneSolutions.org, and he has a background in electrical engineering. And uh, Gary Voss is the founder of TAT10 Research, an international think tank that explores the latest in advanced aerospace and engineering technologies for the development of alternative energy and propulsion concepts. Without any further delay, Other World Global Radio would like to welcome Jeff Lewis and Gary Voss to the show. Jeff, are you with us? I am still here, guys. Got a good good, good connection. Excellent, excellent. Welcome, welcome. welcome. <laughs> I know that uh, Gary is trying to call in, and we're just waiting for him to join us here on the show. But why don't we just start out with you, Jeff, and hopefully we can get Gary on here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about where you grew up, a little bit about your background, and how you got into alternative energy technologies? Me? Well, like you said, I'm a father, husband, um, grandfather. I've got five children and now five grandchildren. Um, You wouldn't believe it if you met me and saw me. Most people don't. Um, Usually when I'm hanging around with my daughters, they think that's my wife. But uh, (laughs) long story short, I I was blessed to to be in this type of lifestyle because mainly of my parents, and of course, later on in my mother's life, when she was when she had cancer and it got serious, and she always did everything naturally and uh, alternatively as best as possible. And chiropractor, stay away from the doctors. You know, they're great for emergencies, but as far as that goes, you know, drugs, medicine, they're practicing. They don't know what they're doing. They're practicing. I don't want anybody practicing on me. I've, I've learned over the years, just in the little bit I've learned in my what is 49, 49 years, yes, 49 or 50 this, this year, September, but uh, in my 49 years in this venture, in this body, on this vessel, um, I've learned quite a bit that balancing the body and keeping it in a, a, what they refer to as homeostasis or perfect balance is not that hard. And it's amazing what we do to ourselves and what we can actually consume and put in our bodies that doesn't destroy us. Our, our bodies are quite, mm-hmm. quite profound miracles. So being blessed with my parents being that way, I've always been more natural, go to the chiropractor, keep adjusted, um, the water, all that kind of stuff. And let me see, how did it really lead into me getting serious, more serious into it? Because, um, again, we had the shelves full of vitamins, you know, uh, I think some of the names off heart. If, you're, if you were from that generation, you'd remember these names like Neil Springer up in the Fountain Valley, or not Fountain Valley, Fountain Avenue in Hollywood area. Um, mm-hmm. Really good kinesiology type chiropractor the only kind that I use you know you want one that muscle tests so your body's telling them what it needs not them forcing their whatever on you or assuming it needs something else and um, getting into energy medicine that way I guess is what really kind of led to it and then uh, when my mom got sick with cancer back in 95 yeah correct and, and that was actually we didn't find out about it till Christmas Eve of 95 and Christmas Day, we had to go, or actually her family was visiting her at the hospital. I was living in San Diego at the time. She was up in Glendale, so I didn't go see her at the hospital. But long story short, the doctors opened her up to do emergency surgery, saying, oh, the cancer spread everywhere. You've got a week or two, if that, to live. 
handle your affairs, closed her back up. And then make that long story short, she came down to Mexico, did everything she could do with her most advanced stuff, connected with her friend Virginia Livingston of the Livingston Clinic down here that was in San Diego at the time until she got shut down, um, doing the advanced uh, B12 injections and beta carotene drinks and smoothies and all that kind of stuff, and was very successful at putting the cancer to bay. And as you know, we all have cancer, and it all it is at some level or another in the body until you balance the immune system to keep it at bay. The moment you start putting the, the conditions in there to create the acid in the body, that cancer can thrive again. So long story short, again, years later, the cancer comes back. This is back in 90, or in 95 at this time. So she had the cancer earlier than that, back in the uh, late 80s. It was like 87, 88 when it hit her the first time. Got rid of it all naturally and then came back in 95, more aggressively this time apparently, and she tried to handle it all herself. And long story short, she didn't make it, but a technology I got managed to keep her alive months past what the doctors said she would live. And she basically starved to death. We did get and stop the cancer. We did break up the tumors and had discharge coming out of the body. And the problem was that it had done so much damage to our digestive system, she couldn't absorb nutrition, basic nutrition. Even with a feeding tube directly in her, she was just losing weight and just starving to death. Mm. So we let her go on leap year 29th, of uh, February 96, the following year, um, in 90, yeah, 96. And I was left with this amazing technology that I got from a gentleman by the name of Ed Skilling, uh, original one that he actually built in Sedona, Arizona at the time. And they were going for about five grand. And uh, I didn't have that kind of money at the time, but I somehow manifested it. I just said, universe, I need this money. And long story short, a client called me out of the blue to get one of my water systems, two of them actually, for his condo out by the beach. And it was actually about 5500 bucks uh, I made in the commission on that sale. So I get out to Sedona, I get this thing, meet my mom in Mexico, we start treatment, and uh, we broke up the cancer, stopped the cancer, her blood work was coming back good, she was having some great results, but the stress of the family being around her, mainly her sister, um, half-sister from Hawaii, and believing the doctors, and this is something I deal with quite profoundly, because I've worked with clinics, I've worked, I work with facilities all over the world, I've worked with clinics after my mother's death in Mexico, with lots of people and various diseases and imbalances in the body from cancer to so forth, and... Um, because of the stress it was causing others, she decided to say that, that was it. She was like, oh, I'm going to beat this. This is no problem. I don't care what the doctors say. I'm like, right, exactly, right. It's all in your mind mainly, of course, ultimately, but it's also in what you consume and how you do it. So she was on the right programs. We were getting results, but the stress it was causing her sister, literally telling us, to, you know, handle her affairs. And like, you know, Auntie Theon, she's still alive. We're not going to do that. You know, we're going we're to do everything we can to make sure she makes it because she's still alive. And honestly, in my mother's condition then, doing what I do now, I have, I've had far worse cases and we've brought them back. So we could definitely have, would, would have brought her back if I'd known what I know now. So this is a lesson I went through in my experience in my life with my mother, of her going home a little earlier than expected. Um, she was probably needed because she was a wonderful, amazing woman, very powerful, dynamic, started her own businesses, um, incredible. Mm -hmm. So I'm left with this incredible machine. So I'm like, okay, they're too expensive. What can we do here? And I, I just, I put it away for about a year. I didn't even mess with it. And then when I got sick, I don't know what happened. I think it was a stomach flu or something or food poisoning. I think it was food poisoning. I pull out the machine to see if it would help because I mainly just thought the machine was for serious stuff, cancer and, and you know, person dying, not something simple as you know, flu bug or stomach flu or virus or bacteria or whatever. So I try it and mm -hmm. the thing's gone. And, and literally gone. I didn't even go through diarrhea and cramping or throwing up or any of that stuff. It was just gone. I'm like, wow, that's incredible. And then later on, my kids got a little sniffle. I put it on them for 10 minutes, boom, gone. Little simple things, injuries, sprains, you know, swelling, blockage in the body, whatever it may be. And then I, then I started playing with it at health shows I'd be going to because I worked with Fred Bell in the earlier years when I learned about his Palladium technology, which always interested me quite uh, personally. And... Uh, very, very expensive, so I actually had a, I mean, it took me 15 years just to get near Fred to be able to hang out with him at his place in Laguna Beach and <laughs> chill with him and, and uh, uh, painted a couple of his cars, custom paint jobs, because I got into painting early and body work on cars when I was doing my car detailing business. Um, and uh, long story short, Fred became a distributor of mine for the Bio Photons. And, uh, and I know I'm going, like you said, across the board, but I'm trying to stay on topic, so don't let me go off topic on each topic, because we're talking about the Bio Photon at the moment and my mom and the results we had, and then I'm left with this machine. And that's kind of what pushed me to have it engineered again in a better way because, for one, you got shocked when you're touching it or if you touch somebody else, you, you get these shocks and it's kind of make you, makes you nervous and makes you 
I guess, scared of the technology. Most people are actually scared of it, especially if they get shocked. That's a mild shock, but it's nothing that's going to kill you, but it's a little pokey. And some people say irritating. So uh, anyway, long story short, I reverse engineered this technology and produced what's called the biophoton off of an original photon sound beam at Skilling device. And I did this with Ed's blessings, of course. I contacted and knew Ed when he was alive in Arizona. And uh, um, the Skilling Institute is now going. Dora Lostrom's taking that up with Bill Coombs and several others who built some of the original Skilling technology, which they're still building it the original way. And I was very much against the shocking part and the fact that they're putting mercury in the gas tubes, because to me, frequency is frequency. Any element, especially elemental forms in the, in the realm of alchemy, and you're dealing with base elements, and you're putting energy through it, you're going to have that frequency present. So mercury, to me, is extremely toxic, but it makes the tubes light up and look cool. And I really don't care how they look. I care how they work. So I took the mercury right. out. I changed the coil inside, or actually that was at, at the suggestion of a brilliant, absolutely brilliant genius, and this is the guy you definitely want to have on your show someday, Hans Becker. Okay of uh, Becker All Enterprises, right. HBS Enterprises, out of uh, Idaho. Did you say Bob Becker, Jeff? Hans, Did you say Hans Bob Becker? Becker? Hans Becker. Oh, okay. And uh, he helped me reverse engineer this technology based on the Genesis device he had created, and some other plasma um, electromagnetic uh, lymph stimulation technology, because he was dealing with personal issues and health challenges himself, and put this other version of a coil in there. Now, now, now when you touch someone else, or you casually touch a chair or a metal on the bed, you don't get shocked anymore. So people are more relaxed, they're more calm, they're more able to use the technology and actually receive the healing energy. And the only reason I even do the biophoton with all these electromagnetic frequency, sound technology, light devices, and some of the laser stuff is really cool, though, based on you know some of the original Russian work. But as far as electromagnetic Tesla, so-called Rife, whatever name you want to use in this technology, because there is no real ones out there as far as those names go, and I can tell you the ones that are as close to as real as possible and including actual real ones. I know people who have real Tesla and real Rife technology. But I don't like those technologies because most of them, as a matter of fact, all of them practically, you're, you're dependent on for, for the healing to continue to get to the next level. The biophoton heals whatever is wrong, sends the imbalance in, fixes the, the whole thing, I mean, I, I can only imagine the research that's going to come back when we finally found out all the results of what this does. But just what I've witnessed and seen um, is profound. And the body doesn't need the machine to get to the next level. Once you've healed the, the imbalance, the sickness, the injury, the swelling, the pain, the disease, whatever you want to call it, the body is healing and heals itself and takes over. And it's almost like it, it, it stimulates stem cell regeneration. I can only say it's almost like because I can't even claim that one yet, but I'm almost certain it is because of the results we've seen. Um, including cellular regeneration. Um, me, myself, I've regrown a tooth. I'm not claiming it on the biophoton, but it's, I, it, this tooth was pulled uh, when a root canal was done, a wisdom, and had, and I, I can't wait, I'm still trying to find the original x-rays, and it had to be pulled because it was already erupted and pressing in the area, so they just needed to get it out of the way. It's easy to pull, so they pulled it quick and it was done. And then years later, when I started building the biophoton in 98, um, I was already using the similar technology, the photon sound beam I had that I bought through uh, one of Skilling's reps in uh, Sedona and was using that. And those had special gases of just xenon because we're finding the different gases too. That's a whole realm of different healing aspects and things it works on. And xenon being the most expensive and rarest of the gases and hardest to get these days um, is a regenerative gas. When you study uh, John Fox's work uh, from Helioron, he is a uh, St. Germain type uh, follower person. You just look him up, John Fox. Oops, is that me or you? That That is us. Sorry about that, Jeff. What we're trying to do is place that call to Gary to get him on here. Oh, okay. okay. Got, no worries. We got an urgent text from him. <laughs> Sounds and, like uh, I Gary Fox, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Hey, hey there he is. Okay, Gary. Okay, uh, Jeff was just telling us a little bit about his, his, uh, his background here. And uh, he was going into the biophoton and uh, the xenon gla- or um, gas. It's exactly, like, exactly. Right. So Jeff, if you can go ahead and continue, and then we'll bring in Gary just in just a few seconds. Go ahead. Absolutely, absolutely. How you doing, my brother? Real good. Good to hear you. You too. You too. Sorry about the technical div. No worries. All right. So anyways, <laughs> we're just coming over the biophoton, and I was getting into the gases and John Fox's work uh, on the various gases in particular. We we're talking about xenon being a regenerative. Uh, gas that we're finding and then you've got the argon gas which stirs up the bugs and the viruses and so forth and you've got the neon gas that kills them in the infrared spectrum um actually i didn't get any of that yet so that's all new information but uh that's where we're at right now um so 
So the biophoton, ultimately, in the way I market it now, I don't talk about Rye for Tesla or any of that stuff. I will again because they deserve the respect that they should be getting. But I just want to make sure I stay alive, my kids stay alive, my grandkids stay alive long enough so we can get this out there enough. I've got several thousand units, maybe one or two thousand at least, that I've personally built all over the planet, every single one of them achieving incredible results. And the testimonies coming back have just been, you know, heartbreakingly profound. <laughs> Tears to your eye every time, especially when children are involved or, you know, it's a serious situation. It's a younger loved one, not, not an older person. And uh, water, of course, this, this is not skip water, but with the biophoton, I don't, won't even sell a person the biophoton or have them use it in any way, shape, or form if they're not drinking a, and I, I don't like to use, use the word just good anymore, but living activated water. Not these just structured or high alkaline waters. That's definitely absolutely not the way to go. That's not the way nature does it. And if you want to keep it simple, we simple, simply follow the principles of nature, and the term for that is called biomimicry. It's a new term, and people are going to be hearing quite a bit more these days, and that simply means studying the way nature does it, and then finding a way to duplicate it as good or better, but better is usually never really possible, but we're altering, say, our current technology to act in a way that nature does to get an end product that nature would also produce. Maybe not as good, but at least taking a dead water, for instance, like most of our bottled waters out there, most of our filtered dead waters everybody's using, claiming they've got really good water, or people claiming they're drinking the best distilled water there is, which is the worst thing you could do to drink all the time, actually. Um, don't. They've actually got a dead water. If you're not activating the hydrogen in there, if those hydrogen atoms aren't actively forming bubbles on the glass of your container, your water is not activated. That means you may have a clean, stripped, you know, energetically pure water, which, again, that's a whole other topic that I need to cover at this moment. Most filtration just handles physical matter. There is no filtration, ultimately, that I'm aware of, other than the way we use our vortexing technology and magnetics, but as far as filtration goes in the, in the standard water filtration market, the best of the best out there, there's nothing out there to remove chemicals other than basic uh, chlorine, maybe some of the good ROs will do fluorides and arsenics and cadmium and things like that, but they will do nothing for the chemicals in the pharmaceutical, for harm, the word harm in there, of course, pharmaceutical realm that are contained in there as well, or the homeopathic frequencies of whatever toxin, disease, blood, urine, feces, and everything else that's come in contact with that water, that even chlorine and RO or even distillation will not ultimately remove that present resonant frequency similar and exactly like homeopathics. So what we do in vortexing the technology, in vortexing the water, like a river does when the water spins around through the rocks, it spins in both directions, so there is no one direction to spin it. You want to multi-spin it. And we mimic this technology in our PVC piping with spheres inside there that cause the water to do the same thing, as well as standard, even regular, big, giant vortexing through rare earth magnetic fields. And we use the magnetizer group. That is from Peter Kulich, K U. L-I-C-H, if I'm not mistaken, the Magnetizer Group. You can look them up. They've got great commercial and industrial magnets for your boilers and things like that. We'll never have calcium, lime, build-up debris, or any of that stuff, and all the way down to pull filters, all the way down to a bio line for your body. It actually cleans out the pipes in your body exactly the same way it cleans out the pipes in your house or your building or your boiler. Well, just if we can just interject just real quick, because sure. what we want to do is we want to get we want to get folks involved here oh, yeah, about absolutely. a little bit more about Gary as well. We want to go ahead and get him in here. You know, I want to revisit about the biophoton and let people know about the website and us get into that more in detail because I think this technology is absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. Let me go ahead and give this website out already right now. It's called biophotonlight.com. That's bio photonlight.com and we're going to be talking a little bit more about that I want to pause it right here and bring in Gary Voss Gary when we started out the show we were just kind of asking uh, Jeff about you know where he grew up and everything and how he got into alternative technologies and what I'd like to do is ask you the same question and bring fo folks up to speed here on your end of the gamut go ahead Gary well um, thank you Sandra and and Glad to hear you're uh, on on the radio show with me, Jeff. Um, for over a decade now, since October 2000, um, I really got into studying alternative energy and technology. I was really into that, you know, in my younger years. Curious, you know, growing up in the city and the farm, you know, we would go back and forth, you know, getting away from the city to the farm, and. I was always looking at things, how nature worked, and and uh, thought about you know how simple it is, and 
I want to reference uh, a song out there. Some of you X generations remember Love and Rock. It's uh, from back in the 90s. <laughs> and it goes, you cannot go against nature because when you do, you go against nature and nature is a part of you. Um, it, 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 it said, our real lives get complicated. Yeah, and that's a simple thing. <laughs> simple as a flower. And that's a complicated thing. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, nature is simple, but it, it can be complex. And what I mean that is there's certain elements that have to come together to create the perfect storm, just like in the movie. And I believe the co collective consciousness works on that same level. Um, when Art Bell from Coast to Coast AM did these collective consciousness experiments based on the quantum random generator, which shows spikes every time, in, you know, seconds, sometimes minutes, before mm -hmm. an actual earthquake, it would predict it. And the interesting thing about, you know, quantum experiments is like when you observe it, it you become part of the experiment. Um, like the molecules in the wall, for example, the atoms, they're always moving, but when you look at them, they move more, they're, they're more stationary, they're moving very slowly, but when you look at them, they, they speed up. So there's something to the level of the collective consciousness also bringing things to light. And I'm sure many of us have been wanting to do this for years, but there are, have been complications. We haven't created the perfect storm. There's always a gap somewhere that causes it to stay in uh, alternative energy and power, to stay in the dark shadows of, you know, of where is it going. And uh, when I looked back in, uh, back in 2000, uh, a young man, I'm sure a lot of people in the UFO community are familiar with, John Greenwald. He uh, created, he's the author and creator of the Black Vault, black, the, the blackvault.com. And mm -hmm. he was going after, you know, this UFO secrets. My main interest is uh, there's this controversy of, this, of a secret space program and what's ours and theirs. Um, secret space program, uh, uh, started, according to Hoagland, uh, who is uh, Walter Conkright, uh, the chief science advisor during the days of uh, Apollo missions, he would consult with a lot of people. He proposed that the uh, top of the uh, rockets that looked like an antenna array, looked, it was small enough to fit a capsule in. And they believe that uh, the secret space program has been going on for many years, in parallel mm -hmm. to what NASA is doing, uh, is, is quite indifferent to what they're doing. And my, my main primary interest was the uh, propulsion systems and the power plant that they would use on such craft. And mm -hmm. I believe that's where the crux of the heart of the matter is, because this whole control of power and energy, if you control power and water, you really control a lot. And I believe that what the, the propulsion systems and the power and the supply that they were using on those secret space programs and missions were quite different than what we were using in our infrastructure. And I think a lot of that went into the black programs. That's, of course, you know, speculation, but it's an educated speculation because there are a lot of documents that were proving that they were using exotic systems that we weren't using. And those documents which were released through the Freedom of Information Act. Um, We've had a lot of them that were acquired prior to what they would call reclassifying. And when they reclassify something, then everything goes dark and all the records get with black marks across them so they can't really make heads or tails of what the document reads. But there was a group of us back in the early days who challenged the system. And I remember uh, recalling one such instance where um, they were appealing something to do that had sensitivity with the kind of propulsion mechanics that they wanted to propose a patent on, but it was considered top secret and was classified. And, and uh, the documents had all these black lines and the judge couldn't read them, but they said, Your Honor, we, we have copies of these through the Freedom of Information Act before those black lines were appearing on the documents that they're letting out now under the Freedom of Information Act. And that proposed a conflict of interest because the judge was saying, well, if these documents were supposed to be released, 
or then they've been ordered to release. You can't reclassify something that's already been released, and it's now a matter of public record. And that's where right. things started changing, and I believe the collective consciousness is starting to catch on to this. And well, uh, one, of, one of the ways sure, that you ahead. came together is through TAP10 research and about how you were putting people together for that think tank and how you created a, um, a wonderful open uh, Yahoo group uh, of people exchanging information. You want to tell folks a little bit about that, how that came about? Well, it's kind of a wordplay, T-A-P, uh, like tapping, but don't tap once. You tap 10, 10 is the sign of completeness. But if you look at the word tap 10 in, in like the form of Scrabble and trying to figure out other words that you could use those letters for, the word patent is in that. And so... It was a collective group of people who were curious in alternative energy um, from all walks of life, you know, people that are studying this on an academic level to people that are professors and actual scientists and engineers. It's an international collective. During the earlier days of the Internet, when it really started taking off and uh, getting faster speed so people could communicate in real time and have... um, with all the message boards, and uh, which were um, not necessarily in real time, but people would post to different topics. But then we had the chat rooms, which enabled people to talk in live time and attach the chat room to a forum, for example. And so information was being exchanged at a much faster rate, and I wanted to make sure that we were dealing with people who were actually uh, enthusiasts and not just um, studying it, you know, uh, reviewing what other people did, but they were actually experimenting in themselves and investing themselves and putting to try to see if we could replicate some of these uh, different types of uh, alternative energy systems that were out there. Um, I want to reference uh, Jim Murray. Um, He and uh, Ralph Ring worked with the late Otis Carr of Otis Elevator. You see on the elevators, Otis Elevator. Otis Carr, C-A-R-R, two R's. Um, he was like considered one of Tesla's last apprentices who would consult with uh, um, his works and in looking into the future of energy and power. And uh, he told him about this uh, type of craft that you would use electric rivetics, and it was, it was like, kind of like what a motorhome would do. It was self, self-sustaining, self-sufficient, but it didn't require that you put a fuel tank on it and you're limited to how far that fuel would run you. It worked on a completely different system. And uh, I had the fortunate uh, uh, call one day from the um, producers of Project Camelot, Bill Ryan and Carrie Cassidy. Uh, I remember Carrie Cassidy before I started right. tap tap research. She was in film school in L.A. during the time talking about putting together the project with Bill Ryan and and I sent her the picture of the Otis Carr uh, Tesla craft that, uh, that supposedly Jim Murray and Ralph Ring reverse engineered and had a successful test flight on. And mm-hmm. uh, if you reference that, the video is called Aquamarine Dreams. It's on YouTube. Oh, and check that out. There was a profound interest in these black programs. According, Ralph Ring uh, was a great engineer. He's a locksmith, too. And uh, he had quite a profound interest in nature and how it, how it works. You know, for example, I'll give you this, uh, the lightning in a box. The Tesla developed this ionizing coil, but mm-hmm. we looked at the ionizer and for many years didn't even know what it was for, what purpose it makes these little arcs and sparks, but people didn't understand what ionization really did. Now we have a propulsion system that uses an ion drive to push it out in space. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, it creates a little static electricity, but it releases ionization, which purifies the air. It, uh, it uh, zaps the hitchhikers on dust particles and changes the polarity of them. And, and, and there's microorganisms that hitchhike on these uh, dust particles and accumulated in your body will weaken your immune system. And things that get into your body, uh, they're always around us, uh, these diseases and things. Uh, that can affect and infect you, uh, but you, it's when your immune system is weak when they actually start to take, take and wreak havoc on your body. So keeping your immune system is really important. Uh, getting back to Ralph Ring, and uh, he mentioned and referenced that uh, a black project, uh, they're under a budget and they're uh, given so much for research, but when they actually find and prove something, then 
the research is over and the funds stop. So they don't want to prove anything. They want to prove that, that it cannot work. And uh, they developed, uh, learned what uh, acoustic uh, resonation and the secrets of what you can do acoustically. You can levitate things. And, well, uh, I would tell folks, uh, just pardon? real quick, Gary, I would tell folks to uh, look up uh, the videos that Gary is referencing. Uh, there's quite a few good videos that Gary Cassidy has out there on Project Camelot with some interviews with him. You literally put together a huge think tank of folks, and you had a, like a ranch project at one time, didn't you, Gary? Well, we so, well we were going to uh, acquire some property, but for some reason the family wasn't happy about our research group, and and they they were willing to spend an equal dollar amount to make sure not a penny would get in their hands, and so uh-huh. it's just kind of haters out there that uh, sure you know for whatever right. reasons right. don't want to have any um gary this is natalie sapatini um how are you real good natalie nice to hear good. from you absolutely so uh, what you just mentioned is a very important point which was you mentioned the haters and i believe that this um distrust or even hate towards these alternative technologies comes as a result of a lack of understanding of what they are and there you know we have a lot of people that do listen in on this program people from all walks of life some who are just being introduced to the subject today via yourself and jeff and also scientists who have you know uh, uh, quite a bit of knowledge on the subject if both of you can respectively define what alternative energy means to you personally. I think that would be a great way to start, you know, this conversation, this dialogue in regards oh, to. That's a big question. That. Okay. Right. right. All right. Well, alternative means an alternative. If you look at the definition, it's an alternative. It is a, something to substitute something for something that would be equal to that, but would be less harmful. In this case, harmful to the environment, harmful to us such as, you know, nuclear power as opposed to using solar and wind as an alternative. And there I go, alternative energy and something to get us, wean us off of coal and oil. We, you know, we've had the solutions for many years. And that's why I say uh, there, are, there are always alternative solutions. There are always solutions. Now, finding them... A lot of in a lot of cases, maybe uh, you'd have to do a little digging and research, you know, to find what are the best alternatives to do something that's equally or better, but less harmful to the environment, less harmful to man. That you know, the pollution and emissions that our environment and atmosphere has created, and we've contributed to. Uh, not, it's not just a global warming, but it's a you know, it's a, it's a solar. Uh, system, the entire solar system is heating up. And so it creates what we call climate change. And this climate change, whether it's natural or cyclical, is irrelevant in comparison to how we have expedited the process and, and created a lot of problems, of poisoning our water, poisoning our environment, uh, and we infect the animals, and it goes on down the whole you know, chain of, of natural organic compounds and the earthworms. The, you, you just, and, and then it goes back into us when we eat of the vegetation and drink the milk of the cows, which are you know, meant for cows and not humans. The coconut and almond milk are better alternatives. <laughs> we were actually meant to drink human milk <laughs> up until a certain time, and that's it. <laughs> Um, it's unbelievable how they want to push this large global industrial, um, you know, farming of the fisheries and our marines. You know, what, what, what little is left, we're just pushing everything onto an extinction. Uh, if we just continue to act like locusts and not take the responsibility of putting something back into the earth instead of constantly taking out the blood of, you know, earth, which is the oil, and it needs to stop, um, and it can be. But again, we have to create the perfect storm. There has been a, a lot of people who have tried uh, making great, great efforts. And the reason why we have hybrid cars now, uh, you know, we might have had them, might not have had them for another 25 years from now yet, but 
I think we, collectively we've created the perfect storm to expedite the process uh, from right. people like, that, uh, like the late Dennis Weaver who started the Drive to Survive campaign uh, from the Institute of Economics in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, they, they assembled a lot of alternative energy uh, propulsion systems in their vehicles, but they had to be 10 years or older. Uh, so then it, it went because uh, the legislature does not allow you to modify your vehicle unless it's standard mm -hmm. as aimed by the automobile industry that produced it or else they deem mm -hmm. it unsafe to drive. So they assembled and drove all the way from California from the West Coast to the East Coast and had, you know, certain major metropolitan cities along the way and did this tour. And it's you can look that up. It's called Drive, Drive to, to Survive, and just yes. and then add Dennis Weaver in the Google search, and it'll come up. And uh, yes. this example of the creating the perfect storm expedites the process. So what we need to do is, since do a reverse of collectively acting like locusts and you know raping the earth of everything and leaving our pollution behind instead of turning that waste into energy, which we now have. Um, it's another Absolutely. process. Absolutely. So let's let's hop into that, Gary, because what you and Jeff, and I want to bring Jeff back in here, what you and Jeff are doing is absolutely phenomenal, right. phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, with your IntelliTrees project, with uh, projectonesolutions.org, you guys are really making strides and getting people to really look at your work. We've been following it very, very closely on social media, and uh, a lot of people are talking about what you guys are doing. You know, you, you brought up something really, really important. There's almost like this truth embargo about alternative energy sources. And well, that's like because it's still a lot of it's in the black budget program, yeah. and it's still yeah. considered classified. And until that becomes open source, again, you know, somehow, and only, there is a lot of it that is, has been open source, but they still, since it's classified, um, the people that are in the money changers that run the economy and the infrastructure are pretty much, you know, uh, given a, a ridicule factor to think of anything beyond coal and oil. And, you know, wind and solar to them is a great alternative, but it's not enough. And I beg to differ because... Um, I want to use uh, a term which uh, Jim Murray uh, referenced. It's called a hyper-efficient system. And we call, again, there are always solutions. The rest is about making smarter choices. We need to, they, they associate alternative energy almost like the same ridicule factors they give in UFOs. When, in fact, the uh, propulsion systems that they run on, <laughs> and a lot, a lot of them are ours, that we've reverse engineered and figured out the same secrets they use if, they mean, you know, other people from other places. I mean, with all those planet life um, uh, that can host life that we've been discovering, exoplanets, uh, that mm -hmm. are similar planets out there, you know, their whole mission was to go to Mars by 2025, you know, send manned mission there and create a habitat. And, but, like, again, are we just going to abandon our Earth? I, I still think we have, there's, there's still enough time to clean up the Earth, but... Then the Agenda 21, uh, which talked about, you know, uh, like when Kissinger back and wrote back in the day, uh, he said right on national TV, we have, what we have is a world of worthless eaters. And, and I wrote back a petition from our civics class and said, no, sir, what we have is a world of worthless and wasteful production. Mm -hmm. So, again, we need to get the collective, you know, uh, assembly together and in reverse the uh, – what we've done to expedite the process of, of polluting our environment and expediting global warming and, you know, you know what's the cyclical process we've, ex, you know, we've created tenfold. And so, like, something that would take 100 years naturally to do, we did in just a few years. <laughs> you know, the damage. Absolutely. Damage is done. So we can equally reverse what we have done. We can reverse this damage by making smarter choices, by investing, uh, getting people that are money changers to put their money where their mouth is and said they want to get into clean, green energy programs. Okay, great. They're sitting on a pile of cash for these green energy programs, but they're not going to put out $1 unless they know that they're going to get back what they've put in invested. They're treating this money like it's theirs, like they earned it. And they're, in, they're, they're living on the interest of it while it's sitting there collecting 
another, you know, a few thousand dollars a month to pay their bill for their skyscraper, you know, office building, office towers. <laughs> you know, the longer they sit on that money, the, hey, it's not hurting them. They got it to sit there, and then it's their responsibility to allocate it, but they're not allocating because they're comfortable living off of the dividends that it's making. Again, you know, and then once, they, once they find something that they can put out there, then, you know, the research funds uh, don't come in anymore. So they're paid more money to not come out with a solution than they are to put a solution out there. And it's just it's absurd. It's just ridiculous, and it needs to stop. So uh, I'm grateful for these GoFundMe programs and, you know, seeing people finding, you know, if, if the uh, normal money changers, you know, in the political process – is going to uh, you know create this blockade <laughs> and doesn't serve their interest to uh, award anyone the funds that they need for research dollars, then fine, we'll just do it ourselves. And that's where the IntelliTree well, Project is. The IntelliTree yep. Project is the antithesis of axioms of alternative energy programs. And what I mean by that is um, power and water. It creates a, a, a hybridization of different alternative energies. Uh, devices uh, that use, take advantage of uh, solar, wind, and conductive ground current that Tesla, you know, developed a ground conducting energy, um, was able to put light bulbs in the ground and make them glow, light up. <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> Can you go out in your backyard and put some light bulbs in the ground and make them light up? That's well, Gary, what are these IntelliTrees? What is, what the IntelliTrees are a uh, standalone self-powered tree. Again, that takes advantage of various forms of uh, alternative energy um, from solar and wind, and but they're a hyper-efficient system, and they and they make power uh, from the environment, and they produce water, atmospheric water generation. Give you in a nutshell, everyone has an air conditioner, and everyone can associate with this real easy, folks. All that water that you sometimes look on the ground when it's hot summer day, and you got the air conditioner cranked out, and you've been on the road for a while, you look down, there's this pool of water. That's water made from the air. That's what your 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 air conditioner is doing. An air conditioner is a is a basically and condensing from when you put hot and cold air masses together, they condense, they create of water. Um, they also create wind, <laughs> and then wind moves and creates electricity, and produces ions. And that's how Tesla discovered this ionizing coil. He replicated what he what was in nature and created lightning in a box. And the uh, ionization process uh, purifies the, uh, the pathogens in the air and the water. And uh, you, uh, you can just use a salt water pool and instead of chlorine and ionize the water. And you will never need to use this toxic chlorine in your, and get that in your skin. Um, ionization. Uh, just joining us real quick, Gary, if I can just interject just real quick. If you go over to IntelliTrees.com, that's I N T E L L I T R E E S dot com. You can follow along with what Gary is is revealing here on this program today. He's literally telling you that these IntelliTrees are, are creating their own power using sun, wind, and hydrogen, folks. Go ahead, Gary. Yes. Um, basically, uh, they have uh, their own little water tank, but the idea is you have an above or below ground water tank that that you start out with and the um they have atomized water sprays that run of the branches of where the leaves are and spray out this fine mist of really super cold water that's been ionized and scrubbed and what happens is since the uh, it, it's it's the polarity of the water is opposite of the polarity of the water that's in the air that's being sprayed out what that does is it, the atmosphere puts pressure and makes it like a bubble, but it's more like a dome. And, and when you put them together, it's like when you put smaller bubbles together, they create a larger bubble. In this case, a bubble of water that your trees you know, produce, and it's pumped out from the tanks. So what they, what they create through condensation, they, that water goes into a storage tank, and then the water is pumped out with a pump you know, out to the atomized water sprayers from the tank. So it's continuous. And what happens is you create an outdoor um, tropical controlled climate. And you, you, it could be 115 degrees outside, 
But where you're standing, you're standing under this wa- bubble of water. That at nighttime, you can shine a light on, and it can glow, and you can see the bubble of water. It's, it's almost mm-hmm. great, so like an eerie rainbow effect. Um, the, 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 the water, it's your, then you, you can be 115 degrees outside that bubble, but you could have an outdoor air conditioning by doing this process with the IntelliTree, and it, would be, it could be 75 80 degrees in that bubble, well, it's 115 degrees outside the bubble of water, but you're breathing in clean air. No dust particles with hitchhikers can come in. They come into that space, so you're breathing clean water, and also has a vapor at the base of the trunk. There's a, like a grid, and then the, like water vapor, fine water vapor. You know, when it hits the cold ground, it, it socks it in. So, you know, right all below your ankles could be this little fog all over the grass, getting taking their bath and drinking the water. So you wouldn't need a sprinkler system. You could, if you have one already, you could connect it to the, you know, to the uh, water tank that the atmospheric water generator is creating. And, you know, you can cut off the water that you're paying for. You're paying for the water to come in, and you're paying for the water to leave. Now, how ridiculous is that? <laughs> <laughs> when you can, you know, there's a whole ocean of water in the air that you can harvest. We're talking hundreds of thousands of gallons of water a day out of the air. Um, there's a tie into this process. Uh, it's a shipping container size atmospheric water generator. It's commercial size. And there's different sizes depending on the size of the family, you know, your, uh, your size of your house, depending on the size of your family and your family's needs for water, daily water. So all of your bathing and drinking water as well as your outdoor water can now be provided right from the air this, this is and powered by the sun and wind. This is amazing what Gary Voss is sharing here on Other World Global Radio. I mean, when you think about the crisis that, that we are going through here on Earth as far as drought, as far as food crisis, as far as what you know, people are having to go through, water. clean water, absolutely. These guys well, drought remediation is serious business. And that's, you know, what, what these trees are primarily made for in this, you know, process that Jeff and I and our friend Eric uh, is uh, trying to put together here. It's based on existing technologies, everything, but no one's figured out how to put it in this way and adding the trees. And, and, uh, and they're going to look like natural palm trees. We're starting out with that because most of the arid climates, which are water is scarce, and they're too far inland for any water desalinization, you know, from the coastlines could provide. And not only that, but not everybody along the coastline has a water desal plant to take advantage of furthermore. So instead of investing more in desal plants, which it should be an equally split, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's absurd. I know places where they're trucking in using fossil fuel, <laughs> trucking in water tanks which creates a limitation, and when you have limitation, then you have to ration, and it's very expensive, and it's not, it's not self-sustaining. It's only a band-aid. We need something that's self-sustaining, because there are a lot of people in third world countries that are living in the dirt, you know, too far away from the coastline, have no clean drinking water. They used to live near the waterways, where they did have clean water. And, 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 and there's some of them, not all of them dried up. And for the ones that are still existing, that haven't dried up, they were pushed away from there, and the developers now took it over. I have decided to put out my proposal to holding companies and developers. Uh, holding companies are like shareholders uh, or different companies that are working on similar interests and similar projects pool their money together and they put it in this uh, holding company. Um, Golden Sachs, for example, is a holding company. Um, but there's holding companies for different kinds of businesses, different kinds of industry. I'm speaking specifically the holding companies that handle the pool of developers money, developers that want to put in a new shopping mall, parking lot, or a, a park, or a water park, for example. <laughs> I can't believe, you know, when drought and there's places in the arid climates where they have water parks <laughs> and the rest of us are going thirsty. Okay, enough of that. Absolutely. Solution. Uh, again, it's, it, we always have had solutions. It's just a matter of uh, people willing to, you know, uh, make smarter choices. So, I'm trying to advocate that the holding companies out there that are 
holding the pool of developers' money and the developers out there who are planning on putting up a, a new uh, shopping facility, for example, and they want to have a waterfall, uh, uh, running water so people see it and hear it, smell it, and they want to put up some trees. Um, I propose that you do visit our IntelliTrees dot com site intellitrees with an s dot com and uh, get in touch with us our contact information is available on the website info at intellitrees dot com and we would love to hear from you absolutely you know we're firing up over here gary both natalie and i uh when we've seen what you and jeff are doing with intellitrees what your ideas are what your plans are we need to get these guys some funding out there so we know that we have some very powerful friends around the world who are listening to this radio show program contact these guys. Yes, we do have our prospectus. Uh, the, the website is password protected for now because of, you know, we're at the proprietary, you know, pine, uh, of propi- pioneering technology. Um, so just people that want to um, ha- ask questions, uh, feel free to contact us. Their information is there. And uh, we'd be glad to entertain uh, uh, selected people to give them access to uh, the password access to our prospectus, and, and uh, we welcome anyone who wants so. to behind and support the team. Sure. There you uh, go. We're all and, uh, creating a portable biosphere. Right? Sure, go ahead. What we want to do is, is get Jeff back in here, because I know that we're running kind of late on the clock, because I know that we carved out just a, uh, an agreed to amount of time here, but I'm, I'm really fired up. I know the folks are fired up hearing about this, and we'd love to do another part two with you guys to go deeper, because I know Jeff has a lot of information that he wanted to get out tonight on, on the program. But let's talk a little bit about PlanetOneSolutions.org. Jeff, what is pl- PlanetOneSolutions.org? Can you hear me okay? I have my mute on. Sorry about that. Yeah, go ahead, go Jeff. Ahead. Well, explain to our folks uh, more about what Planet One Solutions, what are you know what we stand for, and okay, well, why don't we let her host the show then, Gary? I'll, what's the question again? I'm sorry. Planet One Solutions, um, what we stand for, I'm, what, I'm what we're to, about. Right. I'm trying to talk to Sandra, I think, or Natalie. Who am I talking to? Uh, you speaking Sandra. to Sandra? Go ahead, Jeff. It's real hard because you guys are cutting each other off. Okay, here we go. So what is the mission, the vision, and the intent of PlanetSolutions.org? Jeff, over to you. Planet One Solutions, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Planet One Solutions is just kind of a hub I put together to get some of the best and brightest um, ideas as well as existing technologies, as Gary was saying, put together where people can go and look at these things. Um, Some of the stuff's already taking off. Some of these things are already funded and out there in the world doing some amazing things. Um, If you look at our, uh, what is it, Partners and Associations page, the, the different projects we're trying to help promote and fund, as well as, like I said, put your guys' site up there and link to promote what you're doing to get this information out there because ultimately it comes down to education. You know, if we don't educate people, they're not going to understand any of this. It's going to sound cool, but they're not going to really get it and understand the necessity of it and the practicality of it and the common sense of it ultimately. Um, They say this is a very divergent type technologies. Well, the technology they're using now is divergent. The technology they're using now is harming the planet. The technologies we need to build now, like the IntelliTrees, is what will fix the problem. Absolutely. So Planet One Solution is, is ultimately a place for viable technologies we need to start implementing now. Some of these, like I said, are funded. Some of these are in need of funding. Um, the IntelliTrees right now, we're in the prototyping stages. I've squeezed the budget down to get to the actual full-size prototype trees, working models, at $1.56 million on our prospectus. But with about hundred grand, I can get some working models, a couple small versions, tabletop demonstrating models, put together probably within the next three to, I wouldn't even say six months max with current existing technologies like 3D printing and mold injection and so forth. Now, Jeff, real quick, because I know that Natalie wanted to inject about uh, any type of Indiegogo campaigns or what was it that you were thinking, Natalie? Yes, where can people donate and learn more about what you are doing now, like the actual technologies? Where do they go to donate? Fund? Yeah, donate yeah, and fund. Oh, well, fund I've got both the donate button on the Planet One Solutions site on that uh, Partners and Associations page down towards the bottom. Uh, we prefer at this time, based on what's going on with the economy, Bitcoin or other currencies other than FRNs, but we will accept those as well via PayPal. Um, and there's one also on the IntelliTrees uh, home page, I think it is, if I'm not mistaken. I should have that up right now. But, yeah, I think it's a home page on the IntelliTree site. Down towards the bottom, there's a uh, donate button as well as a PayPal, or sorry, PayPal, a uh, Bitcoin address link to send Bitcoin 
Fantastic, fantastic. Now, I know that you guys are really focusing on energy and water, but you guys are also focusing on GMO-free, safe foods and sustainable environment so that, that we all can thrive in. And uh, I know that, Jeff, that you were just talking earlier when we started the show about the biophoton. And uh, I know that, that you and Gary are working on, on these things together. And I really like for the, the next 20 minutes that we have left in the show is to really turn it over to you guys to talk about the biophoton, to talk about some of the industry trends that you guys are seeing right now and alternative energy and what you guys see for the future for all of us out here. Gary, you want to start that off? Leave me a, leave me a minute or so maybe? <laughs> sure. Um, the future where I'd like to take this to is uh, creating a portable biosphere. Um, first of all, we're looking into um, research grants as another part of the program, um, techno- research and technology grants, so we can get uh, some prototypes built that we're going to ship off a pot of these IntelliTrees off to the Biosphere 2 Research Center in Phoenix, Arizona. And also part of that future entails replicating our own portable biosphere with our IntelliGrass, which is grass that our artificial grass that uses nanotechnology, and it, it actually programs real grass seed that's built in it, and it's packed with this, like this gel polymer substance clay mix for the bottom, so it retains moisture, you know, from, from, for a lot longer. And the, uh, our, uh, the artificial IntelliGrass programs the real grass, so once you cut it, it stays the same length as the artificial IntelliGrass does. But an interesting hap- thing will happen is, in, uh, when, when it's, when, if, if the uh, natural grass gets infected by aphids or whatever type of thing is causing it to brown, it will not brown. It will always stay green. <laughs> and even if all the grass seed died and dried up and you put it out in the Arizona, out in the desert for a show or something and you didn't have it in a closed dome, you just had it out there for some kind of show and all the grass seed died up and the grass died, it was, the natural IntelliGrass would keep it so it looks green even though it's dead and so you wouldn't see brown spots and, the, and you would just see the, the IntelliGrass then which say is perpetually green. And so you wouldn't have to mow this grass all the time like a normal grass and it will grow in, things, in places where things cannot grow. So I'm talking about creating an oasis in the middle of a desert and this portable biosphere um, would, do the, would do the honors of demonstrating this on a global musical you know, mystery tour, <laughs> if you will. And uh, we could go to places like Coachella and Burning Man, anywhere we can get invited to bring this out. And we're using a unique structure called the Hoberman Iris Dome. If you look that up, it's H-O-B-E-R, Hoberman, Hoberman Iris Dome. What this does is they put these uh, semicircle, four semicircle on a flatbed truck, and then lay them out and join them together to create a circle. And then you can touch your smartphone app, <laughs> and it's self-erecting with the panels. In this case, the panels are solar collecting panels, and they do have clear glass panels that are solar collecting, which we would insulate with aerogel um, to create more of a condensating effect too. Um, but it's 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 a and it just self wrecks, so you can stop it at any diameter that you want the opening from the top down, or you know have it closed, just, and it's and so it can be put together very quickly. And what I propose to do is for the structure is to use a hemp-based composite because it's a lot lighter <laughs> than some of the expensive materials that they would have to mill out, you know, in a machine. This would be just pretty much grown. You know, there's a um, video on our website that talks about how you can use 4D, 6D printers. It has a magnetic plate, and basically as it lifts it up, it connect, collects to it, and this, everything just drips off, and then boom, the whole form is there. So right from your CAD drawing right to the printer, you could actually just lift it out, and it would be one piece or a half if you want to join, join them together. And that's how we propose to build a, a structure for the housing of our IntelliTrees. So it's made of organic you know, compounds, and it looks like a real tree because we don't want it to be some eyesore in the environment. We want it to blend in. And Jeff proposed uh, maybe it should have brown spots like a, to blend in like a natural tree. And I thought, well, 
why would that be necessary? Because all the trees around would be continuously fed with water and would be all green. You know, <laughs> they're they're not going to be dying. <laughs> Um, so this portable biosphere would be a perfect um, way to introduce other countries like in Mexico and, and India and connect it and annex it to their public education system just like the Biosphere 2 Research Center does. But w w when that happens, it's going to be a game changer for us and for the rest of the world because now there will be scientists and engineers who have access to this right at the Biosphere Center. Uh, in Arizona, and they would be able to do their and conclude their own tests and studies on how it's affecting your greenhouse and how it's producing water. So you don't have to just rely on the very little bit of dew that you get from the glass panels that drips down to create water and vapor in the air, but you have the advantage of having a, um, a water that you're not paying for and power that you're not paying for, and you're being self-sustaining completely. And this is a good educational process, and I think this is going to be a push for alternative energy because it will be demonstrative in trees. So anybody out there that has the next hyper-efficient system, you know, whether it's, you know, we're talking about, you know, um, putting that into the tree to demonstrate its ability to work and provide a necessary function for the environment. Absolutely, and there's also the aspect of the biomimicry itself, um, and that's that's great. Um, that incorporates that sacred geometry. It's very mathematical, and it it's very feasible. Of course, biomimicry Absolutely. is is basically you're, re you're again you're reflecting, replicating what exists in nature by design, what you're using in what you're creating, and that. For example, they have these graphine, graphene sheets that unfold like a flower leaf, even though it doesn't look like a natural flower, but it's considered biomimicry because it's using the similar process and design that is in nature being replicated. That's biomimicry. In our case, it's, we're reflecting what's in nature by design by the look of a real tree, doing very similar. Trees produce shade. These produce shade. Trees also produce atmospheric water generation naturally. If you look at uh, the dew in the morning on the leaves, it's just like grass does the same thing. It, it, because it retains this cold through the night, and then the, when the heat of the day heats it, it creates condensation, which creates moisture, which creates water. Now, now, Gary, we have a couple of questions that's come in as well that we'd like to ask you guys. And um, I wanted to also bring Jeff in here. Uh, he's been he's been in silent mode, folks. He's been in silent mode, just uh, listening to us and everything. I wanted him to hop in here because he's just as passionate as we are over here at Other World Global Network about turning this around. I know that we can all turn this around. We all need just to come together under this common goal. And that's one thing, uh, too, I wanted to discuss with uh, all of you out there, um, the concept of Earth Hope and what we're doing over at Earth Hope, a global community. Put out that extension out there to, to Gary and Jeff to join us in that outreach of bringing folks together because I know that, that the stronger that we are together, the more that we can do to push this forward and break this, uh, this embargo, really to get this, this information out there to you and to your homes. Natalie, I know that you got a couple of questions here uh, for Gary and Jeff. Absolutely, Sandra. Thank you so much. So um, one of the questions um, actually has to do with longevity. In your opinion, guys, will humanity collectively, collectively live longer with greater availability of global alternative energy modalities? And that was from Robert in Ohio. Go ahead. Yes, of course. Absolutely. It's already showing it to be that now. Thanks, Robert. Um, waving a hand to you out there in Ohio. I'm in uh, California and Jeff's in Baja, Mexico. Glad to, uh, we'd be glad to answer your question. Uh, okay, and, and the next question, Natalie? Okay, here, just give me a minute here, Sandra, to kind of look through. through. Some of the <laughs> Go ahead. So one of the questions is actually regarding the book, um, Breakthrough Power. Are you, are you guys familiar with the book? Yes. Of course. Absolutely. I had a chance to meet Gene Manning years ago. It was published in 2008. And Joel Garbin, also co-author of the book, is a, a, is a science consultant. Um, he is uh, one of the founders of the uh, New Energy Movement. Um, together that they, they uh, 
worked on this book. Um, Manning's an author of the international rec uh, recognized book, The Coming Energy Revolution, which was published in 96. And uh, Garvin is a science consultant to the industry. He's the president of the New Energy Movement. And, and Breakthrough Power is a profound gift for people of all ages who want to you know, make a more harmonious world to live in. And my credo is uh, when man's machine coexists in harmony with the Earth's machine, only then shall we truly evolve. And I think what's going to break the ice with this truth embargo is we simply need to just put our, join our hands together and build it and put it out there ourselves. And I Absolutely. think this great idea to put it in a portable biosphere and take it on tour to show the rest of the world this does work. And here it is. Uh, you, you can have it continuously running all day and all night with not one power pole uh, providing any of the power and run an entire warehouse producing and growing food in the middle of any desert that you choose. This well, you can... know, Gary, I'm glad that you said that about you guys bringing this technology forward and it coming through you guys, you know, but you, we need a platform. And that's what I wanted to talk with everybody today about as far as Earth Hope. We've been talking to a lot of inventors just like Gary Voss and Jeff Lewis about coming together and giving them a platform. We've seen a lot of folks create conferences, events, and everything to charge you folks um, to come to it and learn about these alternative energy technologies. And uh, either they get bought out from some of these inventors you never see from them again, or either uh, people promise these guys funding and it never comes through. Um, and a lot of these promoters take a lot of your money out there. And what we proposed over on our end at Otherworld Global Network is creating an Earth Hope Conference, which would be absolutely for free for all of you out there and free for the inventors to come to and showcase their work for an X amount of days. And uh, we really want to put that, in, you know, that invitation out to you guys, um, to Gary Voss and to Jeff Lewis, uh, to showcase your IntelliTrees there, to showcase your biophoton there, to get this information out to the people, by the people, for the people. We need to get this out in front of these people. And uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to launch the Earth Hope Global Community. We did a soft launch on that uh, about a month ago, and we have people that are waiting in queue right now uh, for it to go live. And we're going to launch that on August 1st. It's been amazing. And it's been an amazing it's turnout, beautiful. amazing turnout. We wanted to see if you guys were ready for this. And we see from the youth that you're tired. You're sick and tired of being sick and tired. You're wanting this, this information to come out. You want this technology to be in your homes. And it's guys like Gary Voss and Jeff Lewis that are trying to bring this, this technology forward to all of you. And we're going to give the platform to do it. And if you go to earthhopeglobalconference.com um, or earthhopeconference.com, you're going to see one heck of a conference that we're going to put together for the people, by the people, uh, for all of you bringing all these folks together to bring this information forward absolutely for free. Absolutely for free. Where's and the venue taking place, Sandra? What's that, Derek? Where, where's the, excuse me, where is the venue taking place? We're going to actually, we're looking at the Southwest. And uh, from previous experience, Gary, as you know, uh, in my past, I've been burnt when I've listed the location. And, yes, uh, I remember we were... Uh, yes, and uh, I was offering to speak there, and uh, it's it's um, it's just strange how these things created a perfect storm right out the you know toward the end, and we had the rug pulled out from underneath our feet, and started adding all these extra demands on you uh, in order for you to have the conference that are beyond the scope of your standard agreements that we all agreed on, and and everything was already and and established and. And uh, was there a few more people that you added to the list? Who knows who those people were, but somebody didn't like them. Absolutely. <laughs> and you know again, politics. Exactly um, so uh, we also have a backup plan to go to what they call these home shows. They have home and garden shows. And yeah. uh, the people that bring the best of the artificial turf in the industry 
you know, they're, they, they come there. And I got to see some of this grass, artificial grass that looks like real grass. And I was just thinking to myself, oh, I can't wait to create a smart grass version of this like we're doing with our tree, but would never die and would always be green and yet have the same feel and texture of real grass and the smell of real grass. And you couldn't tell the difference. And I, I can see the future where this is going because if we're going to go out there to explore these other exoplanets, which I know they're going to, it's inevitable, there's going to be some things on this earth, whether mankind expedited the natural process or regardless, uh, the, the, we, there will be a time, and we can look at the global records that, there are times when the earth is not really very habitable and it can happen again and so it's better to be prepared and um, I, I can't rec re recommend enough if you haven't seen the movie Interstellar that you do uh, because uh, there's this young Frenchman named um, Al Kaburi Al Kaburi um, they brought out this breakthrough propulsion uh, breakthrough uh, um, propulsion uh, program from NASA and and his was a way of warping space and time like a fabric around you so you wouldn't have to travel as far linearly to get from point A to point B like taking the uh, if you take a sheet of paper and you fold the corners together you just punch through the other side now you didn't have to really move that fast or far to travel fa you know what we got beyond light speed uh, so, in theory, if you're able to traverse great distances faster than light speed, uh, then you've created a faster than light speed vehicle, but not in terms of linear travel. <laughs> it's impossible to go linearly through space-time faster than light, but this is a workaround solution, very much like what we consider alternative energy to be a workaround solution, uh, and that workaround solution is more hyper-efficient systems. We can put out a hell of a lot more kilowatts now in a solar generator than we were able to do 20 years ago. Everyone thinks solar panels are the thing, but, you know, we've gone beyond that. There's a solar dish that IBM created, and it can outperform a roof full of solar panels, you know, the size of a soccer field. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's wonderful that you brought that up because, you know, we were talking about the conference that was shut down uh, that I was going to do, Gary, and that you were going to be a part of, and quite a few important folks. Um, a lot of stuff that was going to be shown at that conference that would have really, uh, how would you say, created a new paradigm for uh, alternative energy and to... Yeah, create... well, not necessarily disruptive technologies because the disruptive technologies, It's uh, the irony is... The ones we've been using, you know, right. they call this alternative energy disrupting technology the economic system is the way it is, you know, but it's actually a necessary technology, and it's a harmonious technology. The actual right. disruptive technology is the one we've been using, and so I want to kind of, you know, neurolinguistically reprogram everyone out there to think more positive. Uh, and I, we have a lot of bad programming out there. <laughs> Instead of saying "Don't forget," which is, well, you remember the last word, which is "forget," you say "remember too." So anytime someone tells me "Don't forget," I'm saying to myself, "Remember too." <laughs> Trying to program yeah. positive reinforcement, and I think that's the educational part of the pro, uh, program that will be the icebreaker of this truth embargo. Again, is by uh, galvanizing the truth and, and with. Um, more positive approaches and, and, and more, more uh, positive reprogramming uh, through the educational process and with the positive reinforcement. And you know, instead of everyone just uh, uh, complaining about, you know, how the politics and all this is, you know, creating such a mess and creating a blockade for us, then we need to come up with a workaround solution. Right. <laughs> Again, that workaround solution is the support of the people. We have a lot more power than we realize. And we have a lot more power in the palm of our hand in the form of a smartphone and what it can do than we realize. And, uh, mm -hmm. 
and we are living in the digital age. When you when you bring the genie out of the bottle, like what we had planned on doing at that conference, and what we're going to do at the Earth Hope Conference, the free conference that I just talked about, you can't put that genie back in the bottle after the world sees it live. You know, there's a lot of people who are, like, zombified. You know, this political hogwash that's everybody saying on the boob tube and well, if if it doesn't, if it's not recognized on TV, and they can't go to their local grocery store or Home Depot to get it, it doesn't really, you know, affect them. They only believe what they can see, what they can go out and get, and you know. So, what we're doing doesn't fit, you know, how their normal lifestyle is going to function, you know, whether they choose to uh, donate money to the program or not. You know, I mean, how how is it going to put food on their table? Uh, well, <laughs> because they can't go out to the Home Depot and buy it yet. And so that that's, again, that's why we have to work with the developers and holding companies and, and, and getting more people on our team and our administration panel who have credibility and years of experience behind their belt, you know, that dealt with nonprofits and, and dealt with uh, people that are, uh, going into uh, what I say necessary technologies, <laughs> breakthrough, you know, technologies, um, and being able to put their money where their mouth is and really allowing us to prosper uh, because this is going to affect all of us. Because if maybe not affecting you now, you know, you can't go out to Home Depot and buy an IntelliTree, you know, uh, you know, whether you're Republican or Democrat or Republicrat and, or Demopublican or Independent or doesn't vote because. You know, for whatever reason, you believe it's a fixed <laughs> system and, you know, they're all puppets anyway, fine. Whatever your belief is, belief is a powerful word, remember this. And w- I must say, it never ceases to amaze me what a non-believer must believe to remain a non-believer. Belief starts with your own self. If you don't have faith in yourself and, you, you know, you don't have your, your belief is very misunderstood. And that's all i got to say. Uh, you have to put your belief in yourself and your love of yourself in order to have that same capacity for others. And how you do that is you look at around you and think to yourself all the people who do love you and do care about you. And that's where it starts. you got to have passion for what you want to do. And you have to have belief in that, that it will, prospo- you know, it will prosper and it will thrive. And again, that starts with you and everyone around you. So if this is something that you want to see in your Home Depot someday, then, you know, there are ways you can pick up that smartphone and you can connect with us. You can connect with those who you know out there in your network who are looking for the next big game changer since sliced bread. This is it. I mean, if we sold it off to Google, maybe they would call it still an IntelliTree. But if we sold it to Apple, they'd probably call it an iTree. <laughs> but whatever form that these IntelliTrees take place in the future, the very fact that we're having discussions on this and considering putting it out there and enough people getting behind it to do that has already created a ripple effect in the time stream. And those <laughs> ripples go... You know, you know, if you drop a pebble in the water and you see the ripples outwards, as they get farther out, they, the waves get bigger. So I'm just asking everyone to be that, rip, you know, be that pebble, to help us make that pebble a little bigger so it'll create a bigger wave so we can inherit that future a little bit sooner. That's all, I, that's all we ask. That's beautiful, Gary. That's beautiful. Jeff, I want to go ahead and bring you in here and uh, so you can get your thoughts in to the folks and um, let them know how that they can reach you over at Planet One Solutions and at Teletrees and a little bit about Biophoton and how that they can connect with you out there. Go ahead, Jeff. Sure, sure. Um, Planet One Solutions is Planet One, O-N-E, Solutions, with an S on the end, dot org. Uh, it's got contact links and information there on the uh, connect or contact um, link. Uh, of course, my personal email is just jeff at planetonesolutions.org. And the Biophoton, I think you gave that out earlier, biophotonlight.com. And info at biophotonlight.com if you have any questions about any of the stuff on there. Uh, the special is not up yet, but we're going to be running a special on that. It's like 1100 1200 bucks off, almost half price off, on the new 5.0 version. And the difference of that is you can actually add and input your own program's custom light frequency sound music uh we even have a, a llama 
a group over in Florida adding mantras and prayers in there, and they're plugging in a direct microphone and doing it live in real time. Yeah. I mean, some incredible results. Uh, what, what is our time frame on this, too? Are we running an hour, hour and a half on this? Uh, we are down to the last three minutes right now on the show clock, Jeff. Hang in there. Go go ahead. This is your chance. Uh, I, I can't think of anything else I'd want to cover at the moment because it would just get off into long discussions and topics. Did we have any other questions of anybody out there, any lives or anything like that at I all? Know, I know that uh, we had some people wanting to know, uh, let's see here, how alternative technology will transform our modern work schedule and even their occupational choices. Well, that first of all, that word Terry. work is going to go bye-bye. <laughs> Uh, the other word, money, soon behind that because we'll be creating so much abundance and all the necessary needs, survival from food to structures to homes to clothing to transportation that runs on air, runs on water um, very efficiently, and all the water we'd ever need in the world because if you can breathe, there's water in the air. And, and to leave with that word, I want people to really start understanding that we're going to start teaching and educating people how to capture water. We're going to create this capture Condensation 101 ebook that's going to be out shortly, probably within the next few days. I'm working on it now, and it's teaching oh, people fantastic. about that condensation. Gary was mentioning from your air conditioning units, your your air compressors, uh, anything that that releases water vapor out the back end of that. That is a pure distilled quality and usually cool temperature wise water. The only thing that might be added to it is some dust particles from the air, and maybe if there's any solder or lead aluminum stuff in the air conditioning unit, maybe. Minor stuff to filter out, a coffee filter and a carbon filter would take care of it. We've actually met with the city of Chula Vista in San Diego in regards to just that, to capture the air conditioning water condensation and use it for their irrigation and their waterfalls and so forth on the property. So that's something we really want to get out to the people right now because drought is an issue everywhere, not just here, not just in Mexico, not just in California, but everywhere. And since these trees or the concept of the trees have come out, we are literally getting hits and calls from people all over the world with farms, crops, communities, uh, lakes and rivers and streams that are drying up, wells that are going empty. We've got a Jersey farm just south of us that finally ran the aquifer dry, farmland there in that valley now just Last week, their wells are running out, so they're freaking out. And I'm like, well, this is a great opportunity right now. So, yes, the solutions are there, and we can implement these things with people with resources. And when I refer to resources, I don't just mean money. I mean people with abilities and means or connections that may be two people with money or, say, for instance, big giant 3D printers or mold injection bath printing stuff that we need to have access to right now that would save us having to spend the money on it would also be a resource that we can get these things done. It wouldn't require so so-called money. So we're trying to also teach people, including my kids, I try and teach them this way. Like things in life you want, you put out the energy first of all and the intention and then be grateful that you've already got it. Like, wait a minute, I don't have it yet, but you will. And if you feel like you have it already, you will. I know these trees are going to get done and, and I'm not going to get into remote viewing or any of that stuff and what I've seen, they are going to get done. When you have the intention behind something and as Gary always repeats, when two or more come together, how does it go, Gary? Uh, when two or more come before thee in thy name, I manifest miracles to happen. So, again, that's just like the reinforcement of what the cap capacity of the collective consciousness can, you know, take on. And like yeah. when Art Bell did his program, he tested it on his I radio program. Here, Gary. He, he was yeah. able to affect the weather. And so we know that does work. Absolutely, absolutely. I totally agree with you, Gary. I agree with you, Jeff. Together we can do it. Uh, together we're powerful. And once again, IntelliTrees, IntelliTrees.com, PlanetOneSolutions.org. Check it out, folks. These guys are making a big difference in the world. Uh, this is Sandra Sabatini along with Natalie and Sabatini. Thank you so very much for tuning in to Otherworld Global Radio. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Otherworld Global Radio on OWGN, the Otherworld Global Network. We invite you to friend and subscribe to Otherworld Global Network on Facebook, Google Plus, and YouTube. Visit us at www.otherworldglobalnetwork.com.